Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Dr. Arnold Nirenberg. I've been licensed to practice in the state of California for over 47 years. And uh, I've been licensed to walk upon this earth for over 80 years. And it's my pleasure to be here with you. My privilege to bring this information and knowledge and inspirations of a lifetime to you uh, with the intention of uplifting you for the rest of your life, not just to help you now while you're listening, but to help uplift you for the rest of your lives. That's truly my intention. The title of today's presentation is How to Deal Honorably with Someone Verbally Attacking You. How to Deal Honorably with Someone Verbally Attacking You. Anybody over the age of three or five, six, even verbally attacked, 10, 20, 30, you've had a bunch of verbal attacks. You're my age, 80, thousands of verbal attacks. Now, let me tell you something that, may, that, won't, that won't shock you, but you didn't think about. When you're being verbally attacked, no one likes it. And a lot of times it's unjust, so you can say, I don't deserve this, as one of my friends says, he doesn't deserve it. But the interchange with that person might produce humiliation in you, hurt feelings, being overpowered, overwhelmed, make you feel inferior. Those are what's underneath it. But now look, whatever you're going through in that situation may last for a minute, maybe 15 minutes. Here's the kicker. That's just for starters. That's just for starters. Because typically, you're going to go on for hours, days, months, years, reviewing and going over what the person said or what you should have said, or what you should have done, what you shouldn't have done, and, and just go relive it and be angry uh, and go over each part of the insult of what was being done to you that you didn't deserve unjustifiably being attacked, humiliated. That's the kicker. The few minutes of the verbal attack is minuscule in comparison to the pain and suffering that you're going to go through. So that's why it's so important to know how to deal with it honorably at the time. You certainly... You don't, want to, you don't want to add fuel to the fire. If you want to deal honorably with it, you don't want to make it worse. You might say, hey, I'm talking to you respectfully. I appreciate it if you talk to me respectfully. Or you may even have, if it goes on too much and it gets too much against you, you may even have to raise your voice and say, hey, I'm talking to you respectfully. I really appreciate it if you talk to me respectfully. I respect you. I really do. But I appreciate it if you talk to me respectfully. See, that's raising the voice. But, you're not saying any content. The key to deal honorably with it is you're not saying something nasty, something to tear the person down. Because that's, that. then the person brings that back with them and they're going to go over that for months, years, decades, you don't know how long. So you're not adding insult to it. You may be raising your voice. So the content of what you say is very important. You don't, that person might be trying to tear you down you don't have to be tearing them down. On the other hand, under no circumstance should we be a doormat, a marshmallow, and put up with it. No. That's not acceptable. And one way or another, we convey this is not acceptable. But you don't want to say something biting, cutting, nasty to tear the person down. If you want to go the way of honor. Now, if, you, if you're not interested in the way of honor, go to it. This is for people who are pursuing the way of honor. Because honor is the path of no regrets. You'll never regret what you said. Now, again, you're not being a patsy. You're not being a pushover. You're not being a wimp. You're standing up. But at the same time, you're not adding fuel to the fire by saying hurtful, harmful things. That's in terms of dealing with it. Whatever positive regard you may have for that person you could express it at that time. Hey, I really like you and respect you. Hey, I don't deserve this. I appreciate if you talk to me respectfully as I'm talking to you. That's just one possible scenario. 
So you're, you're, you're not just turning your back on it. You're not wimping out. You're dealing with it. But now, now the next day, you wake up in the morning and you go, Jesus, that's, I thought we were friends. And how long has he harbored these thoughts against me? You get right in the pit of your stomach. So I'm going to read you a little poem I wrote to kind of capture this. From deep within the pit of the stomach, tightness, destructive thoughts emerge within a mist of darkness and rise into the lungs and throats. It comes up, rise like this darkness, comes into the lungs. And so it just, it, it's, there's a physical sensation going on with this. From within the shroud of pain, a thought of light and well-wishing are remembered and called by honor to fill the void of negativity. So through our, our commitment to honor, and, then, and we're repeating the commandments of honor that we're going to talk about. The repetition is preparation for application. So you're in there, and you're going to, oh, it's killing me. I feel so humiliated. I just want to you know, say something nasty to that person. I want to slap that person. And you're in this darkness, and you're waking up, and it's in your pit of your stomach, just tighten like a knot, rises up into your throat and into your lungs. And you're like that. We've been there. But then you remember, well, I call light upon this, and I wish you well. That's unnatural to do. Totally unnatural. What I'm telling you to do and advising you and advising myself is totally unnatural. The natural things that continue to go on and just go on with this and torture yourself. That, that's more of the natural, what we're predisposed to doing. But by repeating the, 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 the commandments of honor and the bridge and other things, other teachings that I'm going to talk, talk to you about, about the teachings of honor, the commitment to honor will call up that light, will call up, I wish you well. Let's face it. One part of you, the last darn thing you want to do is wish that person well. You, you wish them harm. You wish them to just drop dead or whatever negative thing you've got going on. I, I, you call upon the light, not because the other person, because you care about yourself. What does it mean to love yourself? It means to love yourself. You don't destroy yourself by what, what that person said. So I wish you well. You call upon the light to rise up into that darkness. Well-wishing, and, and you remember it, and, you, and, and it's called by honor to fill the void of negativity. So once you do that, gladness illumines the contracted self. So you've contracted, you went from, you're not just flowing, you're contracted, but it gets illumined and it gets released and courses up through the eyes a breath of peace smiles from the heart. Yeah. Just like that. I wish you well. I really do. For those who seek meaning and honor, turbulence and pain are but fuel for the journey. For those who seek meaning and honor, Turbulence and pain are but fuel for the journey. If you want revenge, you can just go, if you just seek revenge. And you, many people, I know one person, lovely human being, but if someone says something derogatory to her, if she doesn't annihilate that person, just kill them verbally, she'll be upset for months or even years. She's literally got to hurt that person so badly, that's the only way she can release herself not to think about it and eat herself up later. Many people are like that. Of course, when she does that, there's a lot of bad consequences and karma that come from that, but that's how this person needs to make herself feel better. So, but once you're committed to the way of honor, so then, then we're seeking honor and meaning, and it becomes fuel. We, we find ways of, understanding the other person's vulnerability. So now we have one of the laws of honor. The law of honor I used to teach was, I refuse to react to your negativity, I'll only respond to your vulnerability. I refuse to react to your negativity, I'll only respond to your vulnerability. Because under all negativity, 
anger, nastiness, whatever. It's always vulnerability. A person feels hurt, neglected, abandoned, inferior, jealous, whatever. Well, what I found in working with that law of honor for over five years was I couldn't live it. I found I could respond to the vulnerability, but, the, but some part of me kept thinking about the negative thing. So in five or six years or maybe longer, I never mastered it. So now I changed it. I changed the law to this. I'll respond more to your vulnerability than I will to your negativity. I'll respond more to your vulnerability than I will to your negativity. Or if you believe in God as I do, God willing, I'll respond more to your vulnerability than I will to your negativity. Or you can even put a modifier, you can put a little expander on it. I want to respond more to your vulnerability than to your negativity. Because once you respond to the vulnerability, your own pain is alleviated. Say a two-year-old comes up to you, I always use this example, comes I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. You don't go, you brat. You know, you poop with your diaper and I change your diaper. Heck, I hate you. You don't say that. You say, come here, mijo. Come here, sweetie. I love you. Come here, John. I love you. You respond to the vulnerability. So the concept is, if somebody's 2, 22, 92, 122, doesn't matter. You want to seek to respond to the vulnerability. God willing, I'll respond more to your vulnerability than I will to your negativity. So again, I modified that because... I got to where I could respond to people's vulnerability. But I never could stop some, there, some other part of me that was responding to the negativity. So that's a key one right there. Once you, once you understand this person feels humiliated, they feel overwhelmed, they feel inferior, hurt feelings, neglected, abandoned. Once you start seeing that, then compassion arises. We start feeling compassion. And that compassion will calm us down. That's the light that then, ah, ah, and the smile breathes from the heart when compassion comes in. And the key to open that door of compassion is the law of honor. I refuse, I, I hope to respond more to your vulnerability than to your negativity. Now, whenever you're going back to even dealing with the situation, the person's attacking you verbally, you want to deal in a respectfully real manner. Not just real, where you say, hey, who are you to talk? You're, you're so ugly and stupid. I, I never liked you anyway. Just being real, bro. And you, you, might, you might have something like, hey, that's hurting my feelings. Uh, you know, I appreciate if you be a little more gentle, you know, or whatever, however you want to express that, where you're creating a bridge or a connection. How much of your own vulnerability you want to show is up to you. Depends on the relationship. But you have to be totally committed to the way of honor. Respectfully real is the mode of communication for those who follow the way of honor. Whether you're a disciple of honor, which we'll talk about, uh, whether you're a, uh, a devotee of honor. So now... You have to be totally committed. If you're not totally committed, you'll be swept up in a vortex of negativity. Just swept. You won't even be able to think of coming out of it. You're just swimming it. You'll swim in an ocean of death. I'm an expert on it. I've done it plenty in my lifetime. I'm 80. It took me a long time to not get caught up. I mean, you, 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 your only way out, you're... you're your rope out to grab onto, the life raft, is honor. Honor is your, the shield against your own death of negativity. Honor is your shield against your own negativity. So now we're talking about honor as loyalty to your highest constructive values as enshrined in the four commandments of honor while seeking to cause no harm physically or emotionally. And the four commandments of honor are these. I wish you well. I take full responsibility for co-creating my reality and my problems. If you can see how you co-created that with the person, you might even find something you could apologize for. Hey, I apologize. I did co-create this. You might even be able to say it when the person is attacking you or at least later come to it. I take full responsibility for co-creating my reality and my problems. Generally, we've co-created it, but not always. Not always, for sure. 
I'm grateful for the power I gained from hardship. So you know you're going through this suffering, you're going through this situation, you know you're going to come back str stronger than ever. You're going to gain power, maybe more wisdom, more compassion. In some way, you're going to come back stronger. And then one of two commandments, either if you believe in God as I do, God, your wish is my only wish, or if you don't believe in God or don't want to address God, I seek always to serve my highest values. Now, where does the commitment come in? The commitment comes in the pledge. The only way to be able to live this, there's no two ways, there's only one way, and that is you have to commit yourself to reciting these three times a day for how long? For the rest of your life. All the days of your life. So then the pledge goes like this. Have people raise their right hand, they repeat after me. As a disciple of honor, I pledge myself for all the days of my life to the four commandments of honor. And I'll teach them to those I love. I'll repeat them every morning, afternoon, and evening, and listen to myself recite them. I tell people, welcome to the way of honor. This brings honor to you and to your family and loved ones. I've interviewed over 1,100 people. 95% report feeling good right away. Over 95% feel more hope right away. And over 92% feel more meaning right away. Boom, right away when they take that pledge. Then you have the law of honor that we talked about. I'll respond more to your vulnerability than to your negativity. I'll respond more to your vulnerability than to your negativity. You have to have that one in there. Then we have what I call the supremacy of honor code. We, and people who take the pledge to this become devotees of honor. Supremacy of honor code is this. Honor before pride. A lot of your negative reactions are going to come from feeling your pride is violated, your ego is violated. Honor before pride. Honor before anger. So you're putting honor before the anger. If you want to say something nasty, but you're putting honor first. So you, you express yourself forcefully in a respectfully real manner. Honor before anger. Honor before sex. Honor before money. Honor before fear. Honor before everything. Honor before life itself. Then you want to commit yourself to being a devotee of honor, to the supremacy of honor code. And the commitment goes this way. I pledge for all the days of my life to the supremacy of honor code. And I'll bring it to the world for a more just society. Now that's a higher level. That's an elite level of honor where you're putting honor before everything, honor before life itself. With those commitments you have a good chance, not a perfect chance, of coming out of that vortex of negativity and thoughts of reprisals and just tearing yourself up. You've got a good chance of coming out. Coming out, see some air, you might go back under again, and then you start repeating, I wish you well, or, you know, I co-created this, I need to, I, did, I can see I'm not totally a victim. I really didn't deserve it, but a little bit I did co-create it. If you can go there. If you didn't co-create it, you still wish them well and try to respond to the vulnerability. Now, a lot of times in life, people can start saying negative things to you. And if your intention, if your intention is always honorable, don't think people aren't going to get ticked off at you because your intention might be honorable, but it's a difference between intention and effect. The effect might be what a person felt offended or belittled, even though it wasn't your intention. I'm sure it's happened to you. You meant no harm, you meant well, and somebody took offense. You say, I'm sorry you took it that way. So, you know, certainly, if you feel you've helped cause this or co-create a situation, I apologize, please forgive me. Well, this uh, uh, gives you a good overview of dealing with it in the situation and then as important or more importantly is dealing with yourself where you're getting all the other thoughts that can go on for hours, days, months, years, decades. Yeah. Any questions over here? Hiram or uh, Alicia? Anybody make any comment or question? Nina? So I, so I got a question for you, Doc. Sure. It's been about 20 years. It's been about 20 years we know each other and uh, that philosophy uh, comes into so many ways because uh, as you all well know we, when we worked in uh, together back at UPS the type of insults we were getting especially through management and I was part of management through uh, hourly people the 
the ins- insulting comments and uh, vulnerability causes people to be in chaos and carries over to your personal life. People don't really understand that if you don't have a mentor to be able to educate you and put you aside, hold you to be accountable, it kind of carries on. Then what happens is it becomes a normal sense of language, not only in the workplace, but in, you know outside of work. This is totally true. People, I mean, almost anybody who's been in the workforce has seen how they've taken the stress home, they've taken it out on their significant other or their children or on somebody. Uh, very common thing to happen. And, and, it, and, and, and a certain kind of rough language transfers as well. Very good point, Hiram. Thank you for making that point. Absolutely true. The commitment to honor and this video, this presentation is meant to mentor you in the best way to deal in the most honorable way with somebody attacking you. Because what will happen is in your mind, you're going to start attacking that person, and that causes a lot of pain, that mental attacks, attacking that you're going to do for days, weeks, months, years. I had the same problem what he was talking about. That's one of the reasons why I left my, my nursing job, was our director was just always so verbally I know, I know, my dear, my dear cousin. I know, Uh, uh, you know. Absolutely. And what gets to you, what's getting to you is not only what they're saying and doing, but then you're walking around feeling humil- humiliated. Now, you can only be, yeah. yeah, sometimes you just have to remove yourself from that person's life. That, that you wish them well and maybe you have to quit a job. If you, sometimes yeah. it's hard to afford to do that, but certainly that's a viable option. Sometimes it needs to come to just parting ways, wishing a person well and just parting ways because it's so abusive that you, you're not able to keep arising above it. You know, you can do it a couple of times, but if it's prolonged and going on, then there are some circumstances where even though you wish the person well, you you need to go. Good point. Very good point, Dina. Okay, Hiram, you were going to say something? Yeah, it's a form of creating a hostile work environment as we wouldn't have been able to be an advocate for the UPS employees, right? Uh, A lot of UPS employees, they don't need, uh, they don't know how to verbalize. They, They know they're being personally attacked. But what they don't understand is the labor laws and the mental abuse and stress that's been able to be able to create triggers of PTSD and as well as that you know you start internally putting in there so it becomes a hostile work environment creates a cancel culture because the minute you start speaking up then you feel like you're alienated then you're communicating you're defending yourself but instead of defending yourself you should be going off as the whole opposite and uh, as the history of you and me have been able to go on for the last 20 years I think that we've been able to bridge the gap with a lot of uh, UPS just to help them understand that because they work hard and the last thing they want to be is to be discriminated, to be disrespected, to feel annihilated and to be outcast. Well, you know, uh, so many of the people at UPS and other places feel disrespected. There's an abuse of power that's common. Uh, It's, uh, uh, and a person has, some people can't afford to leave it because they have a mortgage, they're making more money as a truck driver than they could ever have made with just a high school degree, making 80,000, 100,000, 120,000. These can't afford to leave. Uh, I know many people in different industries who want to leave. I know a lot of people in the car industry, for example, want out, but they can't afford to. It's like golden handcuffs. So it comes to a time, some point, where you say it's either your life, your well-being, uh, or the money. And uh, that's a fundamental choice what, what a person wants to wants to do. If you're in business for yourself, you can get around some of that, but but then again, you have to face the risks that go with that. Well, thank you for those comments and questions. Uh, they're excellent. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to be here with you and have this opportunity to present on how to deal honorably with someone verbally attacking you. Thank you very much.